possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Right. It's over the bar. Hello, welcome to the RTGA podcast. Hope you're all well on this sunny Monday morning. I'm joined as always by Rory O'Neill and we've got Shane Dowling and Mick Foley with us to look back on the weekend's hurling. How are you doing, lads? Very good, Mikey. Very good, Mikey. Yeah, great, great. Yeah, Shane is a bit too perky for my liking there now, to be honest with you. <laughs> I'm fresh this morning, I'm fresh this morning. Like, uh, you're obviously yeah. not. You're full of birthday parties the weekend. Full of, full of fifth birthday parties, which meant I managed to avoid uh, Wexford Park on Saturday. I still think, I would say to Shane there, I think I would rather watch Wexford lose 10 games of Hurland than have to go to back-to-back fifth birthday parties. Oh, that's a killer. That's a killer. That's... That'll test you all right. Yeah. It's, all, it's all great fun until the clown comes out and scares everyone and all the children start crying. Yeah. Thankfully, it was all... It was, was that Mikey? It's... Hey! Uh, thankfully, they were both by chance on in the same petting farm, so it was okay. I was able to just... Hug my comfort donkey and leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> never, never leave home without it, Mikey. Never yeah, leave home without it. Exactly. Um, we'll have Kevin McStay on later to talk about the football, which will be a happier Wexford conversation, obviously. But uh, as with last week, um, it's hard to start anywhere but with the uh, three in a row All-Ireland champions. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. But uh, Shane, I'll give you an easy one to start with. No, actually, you'll, you'll have to try and fob this off with a bit of cute horrorism. It's very hard to make a case against Limerick winning the Hurling All-Ireland Championship, isn't it? Yeah, I think I'll be doing the opposite to what Derek did with water for a couple of weeks ago. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, listen, it was, do you know what? It was great, Mikey, because it was actually my first time going to a Munster Championship game with 30,000 people where I wasn't working at it, able to walk down the Ennis Road and just enjoy the atmosphere. It was great, you know. It's nice. Walked down with a few of the boys. It was, you know, it was packed going down there at the end of the road, obviously closed, bodies everywhere. Went in, thankfully, you know, lovely seats uh, directly about 10 rows behind where, where John, Kylie, and Paul Kinnock were. So I was able to watch everything and it was great. It was super atmosphere. Um, so yeah, it was just great to be able to relax and enjoy it and, and um, you know, just to take in the atmosphere for what it was. Yeah. I. Mick, uh, I, I think I tweeted probably about probably two minutes before the first Waterford goal that even without all the injuries, you know, this could end up as another 11 point win for Limerick over Waterford, um, you know, uh, to make it three in a row in that in that regard in the championship. It wasn't that, but in some ways it was more impressive. This might be kind of kind of cheap analysis, but the fact that Limerick were drawn back in by those two goals. They can finally conceded some goals to Waterford to the championship, um, but still came out with, you know, as comfortable a three point win, I suppose, as you can have in the, uh, you know, the frenetic nature of a Munster hurling match. That, th- to me, that's the most frightening thing that will really stand to Limerick, that they actually had something resembling a test in the latter stages of a championship match. Yeah, like, I mean, they're at that stage of their existence as a great team, you know, where they have a, they have a cruising altitude, you know. They're, they're just there and uh, they're able to think their way through situations on the field, you know, whether it's an injury to Keane Lynch, like what happened and, and, and figure it out when guys are coming in and attempting to take their chance and there's, there's that going on and, and, you know, they don't panic if they can see goals at the end. No, I, like, you know, for the sake of argument, like, you know, depending on how things pan out later on in the summer, you, you know, there could be a revisiting of that again. Like there could be a revisiting of the goals and say, well, you know, Waterford can come away. Okay. As you say, it was a, it was a comfortable win in, in some regards for Limerick, but they did manage to break them down in the end. You know, there's bits and pieces like that, that you can always pull out of these games. But, but um, look, Limerick are, are a powerful, are a powerful operation. And, and just to pick up a little bit there on what Shane said, by the way, you actually asked Shane, uh, to make a case against um Limerick. I'm coming back to I mean, that. I'm coming back. I'm I'm, I'm, warm okay, up. okay, fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. We had we we had we, a beautiful picture of the Ennis Road yeah. and the guy But what, what I did on my summer holidays is what we got from him. Don't worry, we'll come back <laughs> but, to but it. No, in fairness, in fairness, in fairness, you know what 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 he said just reminded me of something. You know, there is there is something wonderful to see Limerick the way they are at the moment. Like I mean I would have you know I've been going to most of championship matches since the 80s, mid 80s as a kid. And I've seen a lot of Limerick and I've been in an awful lot of matches involving Limerick. And, you know, when you go to the games and I'll always remember, I'll always remember the 87 match against Cork, the, the replay, the John Fenton, famous John Fenton goal. I remember sitting in the stand that day and 
like as it what was like 10, 11, and the roaring from the Limerick crowd, like they were so they sensed something, you know, against to be Cork and Cork Ireland champions that and, and you've been to so many matches down the years at Limerick where when there's an opportunity of something's going to happen, you know it's going to happen for us. And the atmosphere is terrific. It's actually great to see it's happening now for them. And it's great to see the response of the crowd. And, you know, the Gaelic grounds look terrific on Saturday night with the crowd in and the, the atmosphere is rocking. And, like, they have a team. They have a team that's capable of anything now. Yeah. And, if there's, and if it's a bandwagon, and if it's a bandwagon of supporters, jump on board. <laughs> get as many, that's what get it is, grounds. Yeah, that's get as many grounds. people onto the bandwagon as you possibly can. You know, that's, there's nothing there. That's why we have all these 40,000 seater stadiums, you know, deposited yeah. all over Ireland. But it, but it is, <laughs> it is, it is a very fair point by Mick. I mean, like Limerick have had like, I mean, no different to Mick. I've been going to Munster Championship matches as well since the mid eighties. And you've seen Limerick at some low ebbs over their time. And now we're in what you could probably know class and define as the Limerick era. And I think it's a good thing. Like, I think it's a very good thing for hurling. I think they should enjoy it. It won't last forever. We all know that. That's just the nature of sport. Look at Dublin. Um, so I think it's a, I think, and, and just to see the, the way the pictures bounced off the screen. I actually thought it was very funny. I know we'll get into the match in a sec, but there was one moment I thought, and if you ever didn't, appreciate or value or understand the power of home advantage i thought it was very funny at one stage carol hagerty who i thought was being fouled was blown by sean stack for over carrying the ball and about fifteen thousand limerick supporters <laughs> up on the far side of the stand and it was just it was it was just the clearest example that you could ever have of just you know, look, they were playing in their own venue and the supporters were letting Sean Stack know they didn't necessarily agree with his decision. And uh, yeah, look, I mean, they are, they're, they're, they're absolutely flying it now. Injuries aside, some of the best players that they've, they've produced in this time, missing an all-time great, possibly in, in Keane Lynch. And it didn't knock a jot out of them. Yeah, that's it. Look, Shane, I'm coming back to you again now. We know we, we know what a lovely day you had. Look, no, 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 Shane Flanagan, no Kyle Hayes, uh, no Keen Lynch, no Peter Casey. Um, you know, relying on Carl O'Neill kind of who's who really shot you know, he really impressed when he came on to to, to replace Keen Lynch after nine minutes, playing against your uh, who everybody sees as your your closest rivals for the Munster and All Ireland Championship. And um, you know, it it, it can you see, okay, I'll, I'll phrase it a different way. Can you see why everybody else thinks it's so ominous and are almost ready to throw their hat at it? Yeah, well, listen, I suppose that, like, as you said there, Mike, I think if they won the game the way they won the weekend with the four players that you mentioned, people would say, well, we could be in for a hell of a game here in a couple of weeks' time or whenever if they do happen to, to meet again. So the fact that they were missing the number of players that they were and still won was obviously very promising. The one thing I will say though is that it, it, it like and it just comes down to, to John and Paul can work like and, and the work that they do on the training field. It it obviously doesn't matter kind of what players really take to the pitch because they're all doing the same thing. Like I know they all there's different skill levels or whatever, but like you know, Keane was doing a role and you know they bring on Carl O'Neill and he does the same role or like, uh, you know, Conor Boylan was in there from the Pierce. Like, okay, he didn't score, but like he done exactly what that particular position player that they want to do. Like he went in, he interrupted, he got tackles, he won a couple of frees, you know. So it just doesn't seem to matter who they have. Now, obviously, you you, you still can't deny that you put in a Kyle or a Peter or a Keane or a Seamus, like the skill levels that they have. So that that's obviously very promising. And I can see why people are obviously now all of a sudden, you know, where they, where they may have thought... But they may have thought Limerick were finished, uh, but now they're actually thinking that well, that maybe they're far from finished and the hunger is still there. Indeed. Um, go on, Mick. No, no, I was like, you know, I, I'd nearly, I'd say I'd nearly make a stronger case, a stronger case for, 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 you know, for a little bit. I wouldn't say concern around Limerick, obviously, right? But just when you need, when you, even when you name the four names off there, you know, Jesus, like, I mean, that's a, that's a hell of a chunk to take out of any squad, and, um. While the you know the backup looked good the last night and all, the other teams are going to be improving as well. In in many ways, it kind of throws the question back to the other teams now. It throws it back to Waterford. It throws it back to whoever else will come out who will come out of Leinster, uh, challenging. Like, will they be able to take advantage if Limerick were to pick up another knock or two? Like, would they be able to take advantage if there is if there is a weakness? Like, because I mean, 
OK, it's a short season. There's a lot of games coming now. And uh, like, like I would look, I'm not, don't get me wrong. I mean, they look, you know, obviously the, the very, very strong. But, you know, it's a little bit like it's a little bit like when you're watching the football league, you know, it's it's important not to get too carried away early doors. <laughs> you know, teams are sorting themselves out. Um, teams are getting up to championship pace. I know obviously Limerick have fit their straps very quickly and, and going very well. And don't get wrong, they are the team. They are, they are, they are still the team and they will continue to be the team to beat. But just like when you take those four names, you know, and, and like two of them, if not three of them are first on the team sheet or very close to first on the team sheet, it, it, it will have a potential effect down, down the track. Um, but look, they're, they're very strong. Um, but I just wouldn't be, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't be pulling the shutters down on the championship yet. Like, yeah, yeah, no, that's fair enough. Um, Shane, have you have you any insight into Keane Lynch? Um, it, it seems to be his hamstring. Have you ha- ha- any word? I know you've probably been kicked out of the WhatsApp group, but you know you're still friends. Any idea what we're looking well, at here? I tell you something, Mikey, about inside knowledge. Right, uh, <laughs> when Joanne tried to screw me down in Parky Queen a couple of weeks ago, when I said I heard, well, in fact, or I was led to actually, I said I was led to believe. And then I said, well, I can see here. And of course, the two lads in the studio, Joanne, everyone tried to nail me on it. They didn't think it was getting inside knowledge. And of course, it was said to me then afterwards. So I can assure you that I, first of all, don't ask. And second of all, uh, wouldn't be wouldn't like to be told because that's the beauty of the Limerick setup. If, you know, they're very, very, when you're in, you're in. But when you're out, you're out. And, you know, they're very, very close in the group. And it's great to have it that way and long may it last. Um, so listen, John said he's getting the scan. I would imagine that scan is today. I don't see why they'd keep delay it. Uh, mm. So I would imagine he'd get a scan today and see. He did pull out quite sharply and he did have a bit of a limp on him, similar to Kyle. He so was holding again, the hamstring as well, like, you know, so. He, wa- he, he was, and the rumour was that he, he was struggling yeah. with a hamstring coming up to coming, coming up to the Cork game as well. So, uh, I, listen, I'd imagine it's going to be, it should probably have to be four to six weeks anyway, like, isn't it? So he mm. could miss the rest of the Munster Championship and, Possibly in Munster final, so hopefully it won't be as bad as as, as it looked on TV anyway. Yeah, um, and that's the corner forward. Um, we got we got a couple of masterful displays there, Shane. Um, obviously, Aaron Galan got most of the headlines in the man of the match award and fully deserved. But in fairness, on a losing team after maybe a, a quiet game or two, Desi Hutchinson really stood up for Waterford as well. They were two. They, they, there was a lot of players to stand out, but in a match which wasn't say dominated by forwards, those two like carried more than their fair share for their teams. He did, and and the other side of it too is like I rate Desi Hutchinson extremely highly. I think he's class. But the last number of times Limerick have played Waterford, Sean Finn has definitely got the better of him. Uh, I wouldn't say that the weekend. I thought Desi when 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 they needed him, when Limerick were getting a run at them, he he, he came up and got a number of points, uh, and he you know, he got one in the first half as well. So he was very very good. Stephen Bennett probably had more of a, didn't what it wasn't his usual self for what we've been accustomed to over the last two seasons. But that goal that Ward forgot lads, when the, the thing of beauty like that spray mm. across forty yards, runners pop off the shoulder, was some finish like. So there's definitely room for improvement in some of their forwards that didn't maybe play. So well, but Desi definitely, and I think that'd be a big thing for him as well, Mikey, because he now knows that if they do meet Limerick down the road, like if he didn't play well now again the weekend or was held to a point or whatever, he'd know that he maybe struggles against the Limerick outfit. Whereas now he's saying, okay, now I maybe have, maybe now I'm onto something here, and uh, it'll be a big thing for him going forward. Yeah. Um, when you look at the starting fours, um, Mick, let, let's count. Uh, Cahill O'Neill is a starting four since he came in kind of early enough in the game um, you know so you, you, you had seven points there from the, the Limerick half forward line but then Conor Boylan and Graham Mulcahy were held scoreless and Aaron Galan got six points it just shows you it's kind of it's kind of like whack-a-mole with Limerick isn't it you kind of you shut someone down but somebody else will pop up and do the job on the day yeah and terrific you know there's there's courage in that too like you know to keep to keep to keep trying and keep showing and, and and you know on a particular day it could be your day it could be the day that you're the one to get the brace yeah. you know because Conor Boylan he, was very very busy he just didn't score did he it, you know yeah I mean I thought I thought early on and again I didn't I didn't know whether he might how long he'd last to be honest but he kept going and, and that's you know I mean you could see even in the, I mean you know, even in the Cork game you know Tom Morris he hit a couple of poor whites by his standards early doors but he kept going and he got his he got his few scores by the end they just keep they keep going they're not they're not phased by whites they're not phased by you know, maybe things are quite going individually their way. They just, it's the old, it's the old cliches about processes and sticking to the plans and trusting each other. And, and 
they just have the players, they have the players to come out. I think, you know, look, from a water perspective, it could well be, look, they were, they were, they were, look, I don't want to say well beaten in that, in the way that that can sound, but they were, they were the second team on the night. It could, well, they, they should, they should learn a lot from it. Um, if there's any more of them to learn about Limerick at this stage, but like, you know, they, they, they should, they should learn a fair bit. And, you know, as Shane said, that goal was a thing of beauty. And it just reminds you again, that they have added that to their game, goal scoring to their game. And, when when the fat's in the fire in the championship game, goals are going to be enormous. Um, so you know Waterford, Waterford will need to come away have a look at have, have have a look at things. They're still you know they're still for me for my money anyway. They're still the second team. You know. Yeah. I was saying, Mikey, that you know, it, the, being just so close to the action was great. I could honestly, you know, the physicality of that game was something that I. I'd say I probably haven't witnessed. I like that was as physical a game as I've come across. Like the hits and the tackles, the body challenges, and you said they were worried about Sean Stack, you know. And it was a really, really hard game for him to referee. Very because, hard. Like very, nobody, very hard. It's it's funny. Like you know, a referee throws for a blow in the stadium. There's a big moan going around the place. Mm. But sure, if the ball is thrown. The ball is thrown. It has to yeah, be free. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think he's a very good referee, by the way. So do I. And he's I think very he, good. so he blew for a couple of throws, and everyone starts giving out. But it's not his fault. He's yeah, from, yeah, you know. Yeah, and then yeah. maybe the home crowd getting his back or whatever. So he did make obviously a couple of maybe wrong calls either side. You're going to get that in every game, exactly. anyway. So uh, I, I think he did a good game. But just considering the physicality of it, it was just there was some hits in it. Honest mm. to God, no, it was mad stuff. The one thing I'd say about Waterford does. And I think it happened. I think it was Neil Montgomery when they got it back to a point. I'm nearly sure when they got it back to a point, he got a ball that he could have delivered into Daisy Hutchinson. And a number of times they took it into contact when they didn't need to and yeah. they got turned over. Now, sometimes it's easier said to them because Limerick bring the contact onto you like that they, mm-hmm. they come on you so quick. But there was loads of times, not maybe not loads of times, but there were definitely times in the game where they could have delivered the ball in, but they tried to run with it. And running against that Limerick middle third is a hard thing to do. This is that was, the thing we've spoken about, Rory, isn't it? The the idea that you know that Watford would had they had a game plan for Cork and it was immensely successful. What Shane's saying there, this might be an example of perhaps Watford at times forgot who they were playing against or thought that they could treat Cork like they or thought they could treat the Limerick defence the way they thought the Cork defence. And that's like another lesson that will be learned for the likely next meeting between the two. Yeah, and I yeah I I agree, and I think Mick also makes a good point in that while you know some people would say it was a three point com it was a three point win, but a three point comfortable win for Limerick. I definitely do think Waterford can take a lot of good things from the game, and they're getting closer. You know, if you go back to you know we'll say the All Ireland final of the COVID championships, which they lost by eleven, and then obviously last year get eleven again. You know, look, the, the reality is they are bridging the gap slowly. And I think it was Jackie was on with us last week and he, you know, he made a very pertinent point. He said, look, the reality is this Limerick team are probably only going to allow you, if you are going to take them down and beat them, it's probably only going to be the one time. So when you're cashing that particular <coughs> chip in, you better make sure that it counts and not in some round robin game where they can come back and... Uh, <laughs> come back and scare you in your dreams again, like because they like they are and look, they're an outstanding side. I think it was an unbelievable Shane's point as well about the physical exchanges. Jesus, I mean, like if you were to compare what went on in the Gaelic Crowns on Saturday night to what we'll say, even Wexford you can't Park, compare, Rory. Before you even go any further, you, you can't, can't compare to anything. You can't, you know. Nothing and to compare I, to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is. That's the frightening thing for most of the teams is that. And look, I think, again, to go back to what Watford can take from it, I think they lived with Limerick longer and more sustainably than anybody has managed to do thus far. And I think that's a big building block for them going on into the rest of the championship. They're they're the one team. They're the only team in the championship that can physically live with them if they yeah. want to. If you want to go down that route, yeah. That's, well, you have to. You have to go down. That's that why. Way. That's <laughs> why Cork. That's that's why Cork get tied up in knots yeah. in, in 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 the way they did. And when it goes wrong, it goes really wrong. When you're trying to work around Limerick, like in playing playing Limerick, Limerick and water is a little bit like watching. It's a little bit like like a, a rugby analogy in the sense of like forwards win the games, you know. So if if you can, if you can physically match them, then you give yourself a chance. And Waterford, Waterford are the only team by some stretch in the championship that can get that can sustain it against Limerick physically. 
for 70 minutes or at least have the potential capacity to sustain yeah. it for 70 it's true minutes. it's true because i was at i i i ended up i think I, I threw something at the couch at the full-time whistle in the extra match and my wife who has no interest in ga she was kind of she was watching me said jesus all right what calm down you? and yeah uh, and about an hour later she kind of decided it was time to ask me said how did they play anyway i said oh they were crap they were, they were no good they were, they were useless and we were i was watching the 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 Waterford Limerick match. It doesn't matter anyway because they're playing a different sport from these two. Like it's just like there's no point in even pretending that they're on the same. Like the Dublin or Wexford are on the same planet as as Limerick and Waterford at the moment. I'd be the first to admit that. Um, so we'll leave it at that. Limerick are going to win the All Ireland. So as for the placings, um, Claire Mick did they looked really good? I think here last week I was one of several to say that the first you know you know Tip having the game the week before would stand to them. Uh, not for the first time, we were shown up to be idiots. It made absolutely no difference because I think Brian Lowen hadn't fed his team for about a week. I think it was, was it Colin Bonner who described them as ravenous. They ravenous. were they were like men possessed. Well, I mean, they had tipping their cross cross wires for weeks and weeks and weeks, you know? I mean, months. They, they're, um, they're, they're still very sore as well, Mick, over what happened in the Gaelic grounds last year. Oh, without a doubt, you yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah, no, no, I find like I mean, they, I fancied Clare strongly on Sunday, um, just for that reason that they had, you know, really they had one game to focus on. Yeah, you're like okay, you can, you're, having a game obviously the previous week can be a help, but I mean, from a tip, you know, when you look at tip, it's it's important not to get too high up or low down. Like so, I mean, when you go out and you hurl and you stay with water for the way they did and hurl well, okay, that's a good day, but they're still in a, you know, they're still developing a team. So you kind of have to be very wary of what can happen next. And like Claire, as Rory alluded to there, like, I mean, that game against Cork last year for Claire was, was the ultimate sliding doors game of the championship last year. Like if Claire, like if Tony Kelly nine times out of 10 would have stuck that goal uh, against Patrick Collins, so credit the keeper for that one. But I mean, I was at that game and, and, and Claire were very good all the way through. It was a complete toss for coin who was going to win that game. And the way the, way the championship was worked out last year, the way the draw was, you know, the next game was Dublin. So, I mean, I would have fancied Clare to win that one. And then suddenly they're in an All-Ireland semi-final. It, what I'm saying is it could have very easily have been a limerick Clare All-Ireland final last year. So that's, that's you know, they're a quality team. They're kind of, they've kind of developed, given, you know, they've had their issues down there in terms of prep and so on and so forth. They've kind of developed a kind of independent Republic sort of attitude for themselves. They just get on with it. Uh, they're driving on. Things things are never ideal, but they're, they're pushing on. And... Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of quality in that Clare team, and there's a lot of character. Um, and you know they you know they came and they did the business exactly precisely when they needed to yesterday. You know? Yeah. And imagine this: the Clare can actually win a hurling match without Tony Kelly being well done. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, well, I, but I, Shane O'Donnell and Peter Duggan, I thought made I know I know uh, Peter Duggan's hurling was you know look it's a little rusty, and I think that's perfectly understandable. But he still made a fantastic contribution over the course of the 70 minutes. So I think the two of them just make a huge difference to their forward line. And I think that's definitely something they were lacking last year. Yeah. But, then, lad, but lads, Tipperary, holy moly. Holy <laughs> before we come to them, right, before, and I, I agree with you, I, we come to them, but I just think Claire, listen, my, my point there is that over the last couple of years, like obviously Tony Kelly is one of the greatest hurlers of, of, of this generation for sure. But I just think that maybe Claire would have, you know, if you were a Claire hurler the last couple of years, like you were nearly kind of forgotten about it. It was, it was all about him. So I was delighted to see Claire win and him having an off game, which would give the players huge confidence. And even, I suppose, give Tony a bit of confidence as well in the sense that he, like I'd say the pressure that he feels or has felt going into games has been humongous. Like, so he now knows that he's got Peter Duggan back, Shannon Donald back, Robin Mosey, who was I thought who I, well, I know had yeah. come across. He's a good player, like he's very yeah. good. So yeah. um and but and like they they have Claire are actually a, a really good side. Like mm-hmm. they don't get the credit they deserve. M- maybe I haven't given them the credit they deserve as well. But when you actually sit down and when you look at their on paper, the players that they have, uh I think they're a very, very good side. But the only thing I'd love to see happen now is I'd love them to back up a performance the weekend. Now, I'm not saying they'll be Cork or whatever, but I definitely think they need to back up a performance the weekend. Uh, is there any reason they shouldn't beat Cork, Mick? Like, judging by that performance, and if if we're going to beat Cork with the stick, as as Shane did in his column on the RTE website uh, last Friday, like, the fact that Cork just, they weren't, 
they weren't keyed in for the physical battle. They didn't look like they, you know, they were going to die to win this match. If that's the stick you're going to beat Cork with, then that's kind of the, the, the pedestal you have to put this Clare team up on as well. Because as well as they hurled, they did it like the, the fuel for it was kind of an intensity that was like Brian Lowen incarnate. So like if they bring that against Cork, if Cork's biggest weakness is the fact that they, 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 they maybe lack stomach for a battle, then surely Clare would have to be fancy there. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'd expect Claire to win, but like, if if you um, like the game, I, I can't I can't express it enough. Like that, the game last year that they played in Limerick was so tight, so close. There was there's nothing between them. Like so, and Claire are probably coming, uh, you know, with a better squad this year. You mentioned Robin Muncy. I mean, he was one of the guys you now that came out came through during the league. They found a couple of players as well. They have a bit of depth, you know. Now Cork, if if Cork can't raise their dander for this game. I mean, whenever, business being in the when, whenever, whenever will you? So I would expect Cork to come flying at them um, as well. It's, it's going to be a ferocious game. Um, but how, yeah, big, how, big, how big a game is it well, now? Well, for me, I mean, for me, oh. I mean, if you were looking at the Munster Championship on paper beforehand, you were looking at tip and going, okay, tip aren't, aren't the tip that they have, they have been maybe for previous years. So this game, this Cork Clare game was going to be the sort of the, the keynote game or the hinge game in terms of, of terms of the rest of the championship, because whoever wins this one will be in, in, in prime position behind Limerick and Waterford. Like, so, um, you know, it's, it's going to be, it's, as I say, it's going to be ferocious in Turles. So, I mean, you know, it's nominally Cork's home game. It's, you know, whatever old guff you want to give about Turles being like Cork's spiritual home, second home, whatever. It's a whole, it's, it's, it's a neutral venue and Clare won't mind going up, especially after winning their last Sunday. So yeah. uh, I think it's all on Clare and you're right. Again, it's like with a lot of teams behind Limerick and Waterford, you're looking for consistency. You're looking to see who can put a couple of games together here and get a bit of momentum up. Um, and Clare are certainly one team that, that would win. Now, that said, again, considering where Tipper at, um, it was a good game for Clare to start with the championship as well, you know? Um, the, the only thing I'd say, though, right, is that this is a, such a different game for Cork than it was last week. Like, yeah. No matter what we say or what we try to say, Clare aren't Limerick, uh, certainly in terms of uh, physicality side of it. Anyway, they're you know they're obviously very good. Or even reputation. I actually think that this weekend could nearly sue Cork because they've come in on the back of a lot of criticism. Lot. They're genuine fellas. No matter we, whether we, you know, they are like, and I, I heard you saying that they're making about having the stomach for battle. It's not that they don't have the stomach for battle. It's just I think a mindset maybe that they have more so than anything else, but. This game, I definitely think will the running game could come to fruition this weekend, where it mightn't have, where it didn't, where Limerick didn't allow them to have their running game last weekend. So, and the, if you if you were to look in the cold light today, you'd say, yeah, well, Clare should look. They were flying it in Cork and Port against Limerick, so it's Clare's to win. I don't think it's as straightforward as that. I think I, I don't know who will win, but I definitely think that you'll see a different Cork this weekend. They are one of the best teams in the country when their game is going. There's no, we can't just throw that out the window because of their performance against Limerick. So I think if they can get their game going the weekend, which I suspect they will, uh, well then I think we'll see a hell of a lot different Cork than you saw last week once they were working on that in Fort Island and at the golf. <laughs> like, the, like, I mean, it was the running game that beat Clare last, last year. You know, it was they. I think Jack O'Connor. I think Jack O'Connor came off the bench last year, and he absolutely just just destroyed them with their speed and their pace. And Shane's right. I mean, look, Cork aren't going to go a million miles away from the game plan. That you know, the the basic principles that they're that they abide by. The problem with it is that when it works, it's it really works, and when it doesn't work, it yeah. falls apart. So that's that's the challenge now for next week, like. Yeah, um, I don't. I, I, as much as I'd like to ignore the Leinster Championship, uh, we won't. So I, we will move on to that quickly. So Shane, just just a quick mention on Tipperary. You know, we 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 saw signs of hope against Waterford after a fairly you know disappointing league. Um, but like that that hope is, I would say, let's say the Tip crowd won't be travelling in in much hope now in a fortnight. Yeah, listen, I think the last time I was on this pod with G was, was, was when Kilkenny and Tipperary played in the league game. And uh, I think I ruffled a few feathers in Tipperary that day and came in for a fair amount of criticism from them after afterwards. But I just, I've always said it, when you're in year one as a manager, and we'll come on to Darry Egan and Mexford in a minute, right? When you're in year one as a manager with a new bunch of players, it takes time. It doesn't just happen overnight. And you, you know... Colin Bonner would okay. I know Liam Sheedy made a good point. A ten of them starting team played in the All Ireland final two years ago, 
but there's a lot of new players in new positions. When you're starting out with that against Brian Lowe in his third year, you know, doing the same system, it's very, very hard. And I think this year will be a huge learning for Tipperary, but they'll have to learn quickly because they're going to have to, listen, they're, are they going to go down to Limerick and get a win? Most likely not, you know, so. No, um, not, most likely not, Shane. Like, one of the main reasons John Coyley is involved with Limerick is because Limerick, at probably their lowest ebb, took the mother and father of all beatings from Tipperary in an All-Ireland semi-final back in 2009. Well said, Rory, yeah. And, and there was no mercy shown by Tipperary that day. And I can guarantee you this, <laughs> if they're expecting mercy going down to the Gaelic grounds in, uh, in two weeks' time, they won't be getting it. They will not get it because <laughs> this will be mentioned. I guarantee you this will be mentioned before Limerick players take the field that day. Oh my God, watch this space. Um, we'll move. You're we'll... frightening me saying that, Rory. I know, yeah. Look, I just, <laughs> chills. I just, I just, I just got a vision of John Kiley kind of a la gladiator in the forest at the start point. <laughs> Unleash hell. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, yeah, exactly. Um, we'll move east where, alas, things are slightly more sedate, Mick. Um, the Dublin, des- a deserved win for Dublin. Um, and you would say in Donald Burke, they have one of the stars of the championship. Oh, I think superb. I think someone would say like you know he he would be making any team in the country at the moment. Um, but for me, what most impressed with him <laughs> was his was his accuracy from freeze. He missed a couple, but like he he hit the clutch ones yeah. because as with Galway the week before, um, Wexford would be left looking you know at how they don't have a reliable free take. Rory O'Connor had a great game. He played he he did play really well. But he stands over free, and you don't know what's going to happen. And even Lee Chin, Lee Chin is is like death is a great career move. Lee Chin is now seen as an unerring free taker. He is he's very good, and he's a lot better than he used to be. But he's not Tony Kelly, you know. He's 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 not TJ Reid. He's not at that level. And we said it here last week. You're going nowhere without a ninety eight percent free taker these days. No doubt about it. I actually covered this game on Saturday, and and kind of watching Donald Barker. It, I, 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 last year they, they played Kilkenny in the championship last year I covered that one and I remember Donald missed a few off the frees actually against Kilkenny you know I mean so he's you know he's clearly he's evolving now he has evolved into a really reliable free taker and it, you know to your point like you know that was I suppose ultimately was the difference and he also got he got a, three excellent points from play as well yeah. I mean, he was and really, that's not really to say good. Dublin didn't deserve to win they no, absolutely no, did. They did, they did but they could have lasted if Wexford had a decent free taker well you had I mean you had a, you had two teams that they probably I mean again and as you say it's kind of hard to compare with other other teams kind of above them but they kind of essentially they lack a bit of the craft that, that, that you'll see with some of the other teams in attack. So an awful lot of what Wexford and Dublin do, really they have to fill that gap with energy and really hard, hard work and just driving and driving and driving. And I mean, the last, the last minute really encapsulated that from a Dublin perspective. Like, I mean, you had two rocks that they could not lose. They could not lose those rocks and they didn't. Then Danny Sutcliffe makes this incredible diving block and then they put pressure on uh, Ushi and Pepper, I think it was, down Ushie by the Pepper, sideline yeah. to stop to stop him, just to make it really impossible to get a pass off that he needed to get to try and try to get someone to, to, to pick the equaliser. So I mean, you know, there's great character in that Dublin team, like, and you know, there's there's a good there's a good sprinkle of quality there um, as well. When it goes for them, it, it you know they they're they're a tough old team to play. But Wexford, they just miss so much, you know, and there's just so many. There's so many, so much wrong option taking, and you know, as you say, Rory kind of had, Rory kind of had a good game. He butchered two frees that should have gone over. Mm. Connor McDonald, it was he a glorious pass for Connor McDonald's goal yeah, chance. That should have been stuck. That should have been stuck. And you know, he had more time than he thought. He 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 spun and hit it in the yeah. same motion. I mean, but he it, could was, have spun it was it was great, it. and you can understand, and that's what you do. But like, it should have been stuck there. I think. I mean, I know this is very old school now for 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 the modern game, as they say. But I mean, they got scored five points from their defense. They got two points from play from their attack. They only had one point from play in the first half. Like that's it's not enough, lads. Not enough. Mm. No, it's not. Not. I know, Shane, that you you, you fancied Wexford against Galway last week. Um, as did I, um, and like they kind of showed enough in the last five minutes. We said, well, maybe, maybe they were just off. But um, you know, Dublin, that that was a game they had to win. Basically, they now have to beat Leash and Westmead, which they should do, and then but they have to hope to win in Nolan Park, which, on the evidence of their first two performances, they're a long way from doing. Correct. Yeah. Uh, like 
we, we talk about league and as, as I said, at the end of the championship, we'll all be geniuses and look back and tell you the rights and wrongs. But what good is the league farm to Dar you know, like, you know. Um, but the one thing I can't, uh, Rory, you'll have seen me do a few pieces there and, and uh, on the Allianz League Sunday shows in relation to puck outs and my team's known the puck outs now. And I was actually delighted again, the lads highlighted it last night. I just don't understand it. Like, why do you bring, like, so... I was thinking that I've thought about it for quite a while now, right? So if you are a team and you're bringing your full forward line out beyond the 45, the ball goes to the full back line, you're not putting pressure on them. You're letting them come to the 45 yard line and then they're able to hit it in the edge of the square. Now, I know the mindset might be, well, if they hit it in long, we'll have a load of bodies back and we'll turn it over. But if you get it, like if you get it, allow someone to come as far as the 45, well, they can build the play then because what teams are not doing is that they're, they're, they're not pushing up on the second ball. So, like, you hit the ball to the full back line. I think what you should be doing then is you should be putting a small bit of pressure on them and hoping that they hit it long down the top of the half back line. Right? That's how you try to turn it over. If you give a ball to the full back line, who can then give it to the half back and then there's runners off the shoulder, they're just getting out so easy. I mean, I'm not saying Limerick because I've, obviously they're my own or whatever, but, like, I saw, you know, Paul Kinnock the weekend on the Waterford puck out. So if Waterford are going short, right, they're doing two things. One, they're hitting it long, which Limerick are happy that they turn over. Our second ball is they do hit the second ball, that there's a Limerick player right up that person's derriere and turning it over straight away. You know, I just, you know, Cork are doing it, Wexford are doing it. It's not working. If you retreat so much, it's just not working. And no problem with someone hitting like and you even look at was it Dalo's pieces last night in relation to the long puck outs that the team said when teams are forced to hit long puck outs the opposition team is generally turning them over and I know again and Limerick are the benchmark they're very good at it but other teams aren't and if I was a manager of a team I'd say fine leave it hit it to the full back but put pressure on him straight away don't allow the overlap tell the half forward to push up in the wing back so there's no out ball and when the ball then goes long well then we get back as quick as we can and try to turn it over I don't get it I don't understand it I don't know who started it worked for periods in the league but you need a lot of time to put into it because there's no point allowing the full back in it because if he can hit it to the half back line it's all over teams can build a play from then so listen it's, it's in season I don't imagine teams are going to change a whole pile on it but I for one can't understand it one, no, one, we discussed one, it one, here last week yeah. one, go on, one, one final or like just one final point I do think it's worth adding um, and I know we did mention it and look it's not making excuses for Wexford because look they did have the two matches I go on, at home do, do, do. but I do think the sequencing of games is, is, is actually quite important particularly in Leinster where you have two like look Munster every game is up well in theory every game is you know a toss of a coin but I do think in Leinster the fact that you have two teams you know, that maybe are of, you know, a lesser, sorry, at a weaker level. I think it is a key part of, you know, the fact that Wexford had to play Dublin and Galway in the open two games, admittedly at home, I think is, you know, puts a lot of pressure on your kind of first two championship matches. I mean, and then if you compare it, we'll say to Kilkenny, who have a nice soft launch with uh, Leash and Westmeath, they have a four points on the board. They've, you know, got TJ back and now they're facing into the real serious stuff with a round robin against the other three teams that they're competing against. I do think that is important in terms of, it, does it affect the overall, you know, results of the, of the whole round robin? I suppose, look, all we can do is wait and see until the end of it and just see how the whole thing plays out because we are in experimental mode. This is the first year with six teams in that particular group. But I do think it yeah. is. It has had an effect. And the the the, the six teams, it's just not working. We mentioned it here, and um, we we kind of have to wrap up the hurling now. But when Galway and Kilkenny are both winning by twenty three points, um, you know, like we haven't time to talk about it here. And to actually talk about those games and to kind of discuss the issues that were mentioned on the Sunday game last night, you need to give it more time. It would be lip service now to give two or three minutes to you Correct. know what's yeah. wrong with Westmead and Leash, um. You know they're better than the majority of of counties at hurling. That's 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 the reality. But they are so far short of the top level that um, having five matches or four matches against three sorry three matches against these teams, uh, four matches against these teams in the championship is tough going. Um, and uh, just quickly before we go, 
<laughs> I just do this so that we look really good. The John McDonough Cup is going well again. Uh, obviously, the results there. Um, there was just it's a remarkable scoreline in that as well. The Antrim beat down six twenty two to three sixteen, and they're looking very good to return to the Leinster Championship. And I would think uh, Antrim might be a sterner test than either Leash or Westmeath. I don't know. Would anybody disagree with me at the moment that the, no. the wrong, maybe the wrong teams are in the wrong tiers? <laughs> No, I think that's absolutely <laughs> fair. I think Antrim are probably a bit ahead. They're certainly ahead of Westmead. Um, obviously, they played Leash in that, you know, uh, the relegation game in the league and got turned over. But Cheddar is a master at, you know, focusing in on the game that matters and getting his best team out for that. But, um, yeah, I think Antrim, like, again, as you said, it's a longer podcast. It goes back to what Don Lowe mm. said last night. Antrim are certainly one of these teams that maybe you should target with serious investment and try yeah. and get them up to the next level. But, but just very briefly, Shane, like the gap between the Joe McDonough and the Liam McCarthy, it, it's significant. And, um, you know, we in Leinster kind of complained that if Kerry were to win the Joe McDonough, Munster wouldn't be having them. But let's be honest, to put Kerry or any of the Joe McDonough Cups into the Munster Championship would be, you know, we're talking Christians and Lions stuff here. So my guy used to do is look at the minor match last week between Limerick, Limerick and Kerry. I think Kerry scored four points. I actually don't know what Limerick scored, but it was a hell of an amount anyway. More so, than four. Well, yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, like, you know, Don Logue is right the money. Dale is right starting us, starting us uh, at the underage. Uh, but the one thing I'd say is that I hate this talking. As in, when I say I hate this talking, I'd love to see someone doing something. Do you know what I mean? I'd love yeah, to see actually yeah. someone being productive about it and stand up and say, right, I'm going to lead in this and try something, master the budget and go after it. Because people are talking about it for a long time now. So is someone actually going to stand up and do it? Hopefully someone will soon, anyway. Yeah, and it is an issue we will come back to because, as I said, it, it, it is long and complex and there's there's a lot to it. And... You're right, Shane, the talking isn't going to do a whole lot of good. Shane, we will let you back to your day there. Thank you much, very much for joining us. And, um, you know, good luck with plucky Limerick's season. I'm sure we'll be talking to you again during it. <laughs> and uh, we'll be back with Kevin McStay in a minute now. Okay, welcome back. Been joined by Kevin McStay. How are you, Kevin? Hi, Mikey. Um... We, we, you were telling us there that you uh, you had the pleasure of going to Alan Partridge yesterday, so you you you, you avoided another show in, in McHale Park. Um, well, I had to I had to I had to witness that first, of course. Yeah, the witness. <laughs> yeah, but but not not yeah. in the flesh at least, because poor oh. old Rory's telling us that he, he's only just after getting home now. The traffic was so bad, was so bad. You, you dodged <laughs> yeah. that at least. It's um, a tough, place, tough place to get out of when there's a big oh, and there was a huge geez. crowd there, of course. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Um, Kev, there, there, there's. I wouldn't say there's irony, but for those of us who kind of uh, like, like like to pick out some contradictions in life, there there were quite some here that you know, Pork Joyce's, uh, shall we say, defensive coaching has been under some scrutiny since he took over from Kevin Walsh, whose uh, very football philosophy came under some scrutiny because basically Kevin Walsh asked Galway to do what they did yesterday, uh, but Pork Joyce can do it because he's Pork Joyce, perhaps, but um. It's not to say that it's exactly the same as how Kevin Walsh played, but, you know, two players screening the full back line, um, you know, defending en masse, um, attacking as quickly as possible. Uh, I would say Kevin Walsh could be looking at that and saying, yeah, that, that's it, basically. That's how you do it. Isn't it gas how uh, we pundits and, and, and journalists, etc. cetera, uh, We've no memory for any of that stuff. We just what happened last week? <laughs> With the retention of a nap. <laughs> just move it on. And it is. It's quite ironic, um, and yet it's very interesting, Mikey. I was I was uh, writing this morning about it uh, in fine detail. Uh, the defensive uh, effort that Galway put in, which was based essentially on the fact that they coughed up one twenty against Roscommon, and uh, I was making the point that you know if you've a a reasonable lessons learned department in operation in your organization. These are the things that they pick up on and they will agree. We can't do this against Mayo. If we leave the middle open, this is what they love to do. Uh, and I was debating with a guy whether uh, these defensive setups, you know, we hear a lot of stuff that it, they take months and months to bed in and years. Well, Galway bedded in about three weeks uh, and uh, <laughs> I, I'd, I'd offer up the reason being they picked two very astute footballers to do it, Kieran Malloy and Dylan McHugh, both Kerfin men, and uh, you can read into that what you want, but uh, they do tend to know their onions up around Kerfin, 
and um, they were really clever. If, if, if you watch the fine detail of it, um, Karen put some of it up last night on the show. Um, the, 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 the two things they were trying to do, of course, was number one, take away the kicking game, which every team wants to do. They don't want that ball in nearly into the full line. So they were tucking in towards the D, sagging in, to use a basketball term, sagging into the D to cut off those two channels of the kick pass. And once that's kind of eliminated, and it was very quickly, whatever thoughts Mayo had about doing it, they just, they, they, they ran away from it. And of course, the fact that no target man adds to it. Uh, if, if, you know, if there's a Ned Noche in there, you might go a little bit longer with your kicking game and you might sustain it a bit longer as well. Um, but the other point, an interesting point, I think, is not only do, do, do Malloy and McHugh cut off uh, the kicking game, they were also the first point of contact on the running game. So if you're watching them from behind the goal, you could see them hinging over and back, you know, what we'd call, again, in basketball, weak side defence. So the fellow on the weak side just tucking in because there's no danger out there. Uh, but the big thing is to pick players that understand space uh, but also have an appetite for contact because that's the key thing. We have so many sweepers in the game now who just don't like contact on anybody. just want to be marking space and you see fellas kicking the ball over from 35 yards out and the sweepers 10 yards off him, waving at him. So that was that was a big plus by Porrick and his backroom team. And once it started to work, I mean, they got a five-point lead in the first half, a six-point lead in the second half. So uh, they, they would have been delighted with that. And it makes, I think, the point for me, you don't have to be months at this uh, game. Uh, if you have clever people, very clear uh, thought a process about what it is you want to do, what is, what is the threat, uh, identify that threat, break it down and go after it. Yeah? Yeah. So that was a really good job. Uh, it's, I think um, nine points from play may have scored. Uh, so that was, yeah, that was a good day's work. Yeah, Mick, it, it, the, I, I can't mention the, the kind of the, the system, but also just the, the tackling. Because um, uh, aside from the two the two sweepers or cover men or whatever you want to call them. I just thought that the performance of the full back lane and the guy who stood out for me was Liam Silk. He was, mm-hmm. he was everywhere. He was putting his head where you wouldn't put a shovel. And it was fantastic <laughs> for the whole, for the whole afternoon. He was just, he was a nuisance. And like, you know, for, for Killian O'Connor not to score from play. Um, I know he's only coming back from injury, etc. But still, the guy is class. Give him, give him half a second. He'll swing a point over, over his shoulder. Sure. He didn't get half a second. No, Silk was excellent, and yeah, he, he epitomised a very, very good defensive performance. And the two lads that tucked in, as Kevin was describing, there did very good. And um, you know, did, you know, you know, Kieran Malloy is such a he's such a dynamic player as well. You know, again, Kevin mentioned it, like you know, when you know, when I take a Kieran Malloy, I take a Kieran Malloy in, in in possession, herring down the field, you know, um, and backing up the play and so on. So, you know. Terrific discipline to, to play the way they did. They, they, they held their space. I mean, the one thing that probably helped them in terms of putting something together was, well, number one, they know Mayo so well. And number two, Mayo don't really change how they play very much. Like, if, you're, if you are going to put a defensive system together in a couple of weeks, well, Mayo are a pretty good, a pretty good team to have to do it against because they're not going to change. They're, they're going to play exactly the way they always play. They're going to put it up to you to react, you know, and look, there's good and bad in that. I mean, when you look at something like Paul Conroy, he was outstanding again the last day or yesterday. Um, Excellent. You're, you're kind of going, why didn't, why wasn't someone wiring into him? Like, you know, why, why, why was he allowed to lord it in that way? And that's not taking that away from Paul Conroy now, but it's just that sometimes when you watch Mayo, you wonder, you know, is there more they can be doing in terms of the opposition? And, you know, you know, you don't want to have it. You never want to get the balance wrong. But I just wonder sometimes whether if they had if they had just focused on some, you know, hammer to hammer kind of stuff, you know, um, hmm. I'm not sure they did enough of that yesterday. No, Rory, isn't it great that we've been talking about Mayo for about, or about Galway for about five minutes now and we haven't mentioned a forward? You know, this this is this is what this is what is the sea change here is that like, you know, Galway won this match through their defense, which is what we've been saying for three years or two two and a half years under poor Joyce was 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 the great Achilles heel and perhaps he was kind of getting onto something pre-COVID and then obviously the world was turned upside down that was the logic but obviously Keen O'Neill coming in is helping here as well isn't it I think yeah but I think I think Mikey like I think that counter-attacking game that they obviously set up to play with yesterday where they would just look to break quickly and get the ball in early and be very direct 
I think when you've got the kind of quality like Comer or Walsh, I know Finnerty didn't have his best game yesterday, but Finney and Ali did well until he was taken. I think, was he taken off as well? I think he might have been taken off too. But He was. And, and, Johnny, and Johnny Heaney obviously popped up with the goal. I think when you've got the, that kind of a calibre of forward line, I think it allows you to sit back. And I think it was tailor-made for them to kind of, you know, frustrate Mayo and just break quickly. And Comer, Comer and Conroy, I thought, were both outstanding and you know like there was kind of too many comebacks in it obviously Galway started the game really well Mayo found himself six points down and then the exact same thing seemed to happen in the second half where Mayo were left and I was kind of actually looking at it saying just no way there's going to be extra time here because obviously from a producer's point of view you're saying if this goes to extra time, and I was saying, look, they're six points down. They've only managed, well, it was 10 points in the whole match. There's no way they're scoring six points in, in five minutes. But then this is Mayo, right? Next thing, they rattle off five in the space of a few minutes. And you're saying to yourself, only Mayo could kind of pull this out of the bag. And I think from a Galway perspective, had they let that game slip yesterday, it would have been a dagger blow because I did feel over the 75, six minutes, I thought they were the better side by a, by a bit. Yeah, I, I like Kev. Where, where do you? I know they've had one game, but it is against like you know perennial challengers in in Mayo. Where where did you place Galway now? Because a lot of the talk, including here last week, was that the gap from Division Two to Division One is too much. And I think it was mentioned in commentary a couple of times as well. Uh, that would, we think maybe the Division One pedigree is beginning to show here. Um, but the, this Galway team, like they. Do they lack for anything? You know what I mean. Like, like, is there any reason not to not to put them up there as you know goalkeeper? I think last were, four, uh, uh, last four team, if if not better. Yeah, and, well, Rory mentioned the goalkeeper. Uh, the last fifty percent of their long kickouts, mm. they were they were et alive in the last ten minutes on the on the long kickout. Couldn't get their hands on the ball, and you know, I have been that soldier a few times <laughs> against Mayo when they when they go after it and and they. Um, they commit players to the to, to the break, the overload. It's it's so so difficult. So yeah, definitely they have an issue there. Um, they had a really good effort um, with Young Kelly in tidying up the full back position, which was a, a big issue during Kevin Walsh's time as well. Um, I'm going to disagree slightly with with uh, Michael and Rory uh, about Paul Conroy and Damian Comer and Shane Walsh yesterday. I thought they were very good lads, but they weren't where. Mm. Like they have so much more to give. Yeah, there's they have more so much them, more yeah. to give. Yeah. Um, Paul, Paul is probably the best midfielder perhaps in the country at the moment, Paul Conroy. And yet he had a, a little bit of slippage with a few. He's better. He, he can do better than that. I, I, I would see Paul Conroy. I've seen him in matches where he just doesn't miss because yeah. he he's a former forward essentially, yeah. um, and uh, he's very very accurate. Shane Walsh one point from play. Damien one point from play. You know, for that for them to become an All-Ireland series team, um, they'll have to improve. They will improve. That This will be mon- huge for their confidence levels. So where are they, Mikey? They're out the gap. That's where they are now. And that's, yeah. dangerous. that's dangerous for a lot of teams because they're a confidence team. And of course, their supporters now will start buying into them as well. This is classic Galway. They, if they get any sort of a sniff at all that they have a team... Um, and yesterday would have confirmed because I think Porrick, Porrick Joyce, it, it's hard to quantify, lads, the pressure he was under yesterday. He got a sense of it afterwards, the celebrations on the sideline. I'd remind you, that was a, a Connacht quarterfinal yesterday. You'd swear it was a Connacht final, wouldn't you? Mm. Um, mm. But, but I understand totally because that was, yesterday was perhaps his management career defining game. And for some of the senior players, I would have argued perhaps career-defining game as well for, you know, the Walsh's, I know he's only 28 or 9, but Comer and Conroy have been around a long time as well. Yes, there was a game they could not lose. And that was the advantage they had on Mayo that we know the narrative surrounding Mayo is that they can take the qualifier route and, but it's a bit tougher this, this year now, the qualifier route. So to, uh, to answer your question, Mikey, um, they're up and running. They're not up their full height yet now, but by, they're definitely off their knees and they're beginning to stretch their full height and um, they are now hugely dangerous opponents for anybody, I would suggest, left. And, and if, if their confidence grows, and history tells us this is what happens um, at Galway, because generally speaking, Galway get to Crow Park, and, and I know the recent history wouldn't be perhaps hectic, but when they get to Crow Park, it doesn't frighten them. Um, and then, so they're set up lovely for the season. They're set up gorgeous for the season ahead, yeah. 
yeah. they're starting to, and I think there's another, like, there was one noticeable element. I mean, you could probably call it maturity in their play, <clears> or you could call it cynicism, or you, you know, whichever, which, whatever you're having yourself. But I did think it was um, remarkable in that the, the black character, Finney and O'Lee, I thought was quite interesting in that the 10 minutes that he was off, how they managed that. You know, mm-hmm. three head, uh, three head injuries, and the goalkeeper three, on a work route. Three head injuries, and I. But but you'd probably say Galway teams in the past maybe might have been a slightly more innocent or slightly more naive. I think managing those sin bin clocks now is a big part of the modern game. If you do go down to fourteen, because a lot of damage can be but done Rory, in that period. Rory, I was just making the point to Keith Duggan earlier, an hour or so earlier. Like on this black card. Mm. Uh, now the rule is composed in a way that is totally open to exploitation, yeah. obviously. And good luck to Galway or Mayo or Cork or whoever else goes after it. If the rule is written that way, of course you're going to exploit it. Okay? But why can't the fourth official just have a stopwatch in his hand? Now, mm. people say, oh, it costs thousands to put clocks on walls around stadia and what happens out in Belmullet? Blah, blah, blah. Just a simple stopwatch in the fourth official's hand and when there's an injury, stop it. So all he has to do is time the 10 minutes. It'll, just not stop, yeah, it'll cut out all of that. Yeah, yeah, like yesterday was was like, it's in the rules, they exploited it. And poor old Goff, do you see then, if he says play on on a head injury, and it's a serious head injury, then he's he's swamped. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Rory, um, what of Mayo now, Rory? They've got four to six but, weeks. Yeah, no, four to six weeks. That's the key. Because obviously if... um if Cav- four like- if Cav, sorry, Kev. Why do you say four? Because if Cavan or Tipperary make a provincial oh, final, yeah, yeah. then they'll have to have a preliminary um, round gotcha, qualifier gotcha. before the first round qualifiers begin. So that, the Mayo's hadn't factored or, that or, in. Or, or Wexford or Wicklow. Or Wexford or Wicklow. There you go. You know, so that that was that, that's might, that's penciled he, in he, for the weekend he, of May twenty second. But but the the, the 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 strong probability is it's June 4th, which is six weeks. And I saw him in Fitzmaurice making the point in the Irish Examiner this morning that that might not necessarily be a bad thing for Mayo in terms of clearing up some of their injuries, trying to get a bit more game time, maybe release Killian O'Connor back to play a club match or two, um, get a bit more game time into him, uh, regroup. And like, you'd still see Mayo. And when we get to quarterfinals weekend, if you don't see Mayo there, you'd be shocked, wouldn't you? Yeah, but suppose you draw, suppose you draw an hour am I out in the athletic grounds on a Saturday. I'd say, day. I'd say they'd have oh, no problem. They'd, they'd have no, off. they'd have no problem, no problem at all. No, no. J- judging by yesterday's performance, you wouldn't by be too worried for them. Yeah. Well. Uh, what do you think, Mick? Mayo, like we're, uh, uh, people only look stupid writing Mayo off, so I don't expect you to do that. <laughs> no, no. Like I mean, six weeks is an, if it is if it does turn out to be the six weeks, like it's. That's a good old chunk of a block to sort of go, right, lads, let's reset, get the injuries right, do a bit of hard training somewhere along the way and just, just taper into taper into a qualifier, whoever it'll be, and it'll be a decent game. It's not going to be a gimme. So, yeah, look, they'll be fine. I mean, from a Galway perspective, yeah, there was more on yesterday for Galway than there was for Mayo as well. Um, and, you know, just in terms of the way they went about the game and the, the defensive thing and all the rest of it, like there's so much, you can see so much learning in that team now. I mean, I remember going back a few years ago when Kevin Walsh was in charge and they were trying to install this defensive mindset system and, you know, talking to somebody who would have been very close to the setup there. And you were, they were literally like having to walk the lads through every single move, you know, I mean, it just was not in their makeup to play in this way. And that's however many, three, four years ago. So like, you know, they had that learning in them now that, that if they have to play this way, they can, which is an advantage for the, for the current coach. Um, and they have the firepower. And if this was a knockout championship, you'd be going, oh, you know, Galway are going now, but it's it's a different gravy. And Roscommon, we haven't even mentioned Roscommon, who have Sligo at the weekend. And if they can get over Sligo, Roscommon would have absolutely no fears whatsoever no. of Galway. Mm-hmm. And we could be having a very, very, very different conversation in a couple of more yeah. weeks' time. Absolutely, yeah. No, it's it, it's uh, it's an intriguing championship now, Kevin. Because as you know, like <laughs> you probably know better than anyone, will Galway beat Mayo, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The team that are always left out of this conversation are Roscommon until they go on and beat the whoever, whichever one of the two bait each other. Yeah, well, I, I can. I think you'll all agree. One thing I definitely know about the Roscommon team is the Roscommon forwards are every bit as good mm-hmm. as anything that's in Connacht. 
uh, for sure. And in, in the Smith, they have a, a goal machine of a midfielder. Um, and they have definitely, since my time uh, with them, they have definitely consolidated. They're a tougher team to play against. Their defensive setup is very tight and they're hard to beat. Now, they've beaten Galway twice this season. Looking for a hat-trick in the one year will be a big one. But uh, they've taken two kind of championships off Galway in the last um, the last five years. So they won't for be for a second in awe of Galway. I was trying to figure out this morning where the match was and I couldn't. I lost my thread around uh, when Anthony won it in 19 with Ross Common. That was up in Galway. I can't remember if, if Galway were down the hide since. I don't know if any he can. So I'm not sure where that final will be. But they have to beat Sligo first. And Sligo has been a very tricky game for Ross Common in the past. Whatever the psychology of that contest is, I don't know what. Is it the pitch? Is it that the expectation is you beat Sligo and that doesn't suit the Ross Common psyche? I'm not sure. But I certainly expect that they will beat Sligo and set up a final against Galway. I'm not quite sure where that final would be. But yeah, they'll have to jump the first fence, as Michael said. Um, yeah, they'd have to take Galway on their mer- mm. like on their merits and do do their business in a proper and professional way and get ready for a final then. Yeah. Um, okay, we'll move east. And normally when I say that, Rory, you'll know I, I, I mean we're going to go to Ulster because we always leave Leinster to last because who, who wants to talk about the Leinster Championship? I'll tell you who does. I want to talk about the Leinster <laughs> Championship. <laughs> the only when- prediction, about the only prediction I got right last week, Mike, he was Wexford beating off. Yeah, no, I, I said Wicklow would beat Leash and none of you disagreed with me, so you can claim that, that one amazing. as well. That was an amazing result, in fairness. Yeah, it was. I, um, I, had to, I had to enjoy the, the, the package on the Sunday game last night um, where the RTU reporter was doing the Wicklow Leash and in just the most offhand kind of way possible said, and Wicklow were leading Leash by 3 11 to 2 3, and just moved along as though that's just the thing that happens, you know? It was like, lads, we're watching something extraordinary happening here, you know? It, it really was something. And look, I know none of us saw more probably than the highlights that were on the Sunday game. So, so we, can't, we can't talk with a huge amount of authority about it. But for Wicklow to beat Leash by 5 15 to 4 12, Kevin, is remarkable. And I tell you, the one thing I took away, I went to an O'Byrne Cup match in Bray between Wexford and Wicklow. And the one thing I took away from it is, is this Kevin Quinn lad who plays full forward for Wicklow is pretty handy. And he it's nice to see it's nice to see something come to fruition. He plays for Blessington. Uh, I don't know what age, he's probably 21, 22. He looks young. He just, he's he can win his own ball. And he didn't bother scoring a point yesterday. He just scored a good old fashioned soccer hat trick. <laughs> The Sunday game package was like a soccer match. I was showing the goals. Nine-goal <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nine thriller. Yeah, yeah. 30 points allowed in this game. But uh, <laughs> they were good goals. Just they were rifled in yeah, some yeah. super goals. And, uh, yeah, you, your lad got the hat-trick, didn't he? So, yeah. um, Quinn. So, like, if you look at them, they were in chaos about, was it three, two, three months ago, was it? Did they, not the even Colin, that long ago. Colin, was, was change of manager to Colin Kelly pack up or? Yeah, yeah. He, 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 uh, work, work commitments. Over, actually, just to give you a bit of background on him. Uh, so, the, you know, the, the seven degrees of separation. Um, Alan Costello is a Mayo lad who I trained with Mayo under 21s 20, 20 years ago. And he's stuck in there with some other lad helping him out. And uh, uh, they turned it around incredibly like leash is still a kind of can you stand up a bit and say geez that's a reasonable scalp like leash are kind of what number three in leinster i know they're not but that's in our brains kind of yeah. it could be number three or number four in leinster couldn't they like you know dublin me kildare leash kind of style but geez they're uh, they're well down the well down the pecking order but i'll give you a funny one uh we're talking about the leinster ones and the difference we talked about the package last night the difference between winning and losing in the championship there's a piece in the uh, paul kane added he said that after this was the loud, the loud Carlo one, the wherever loud hammer them. And the Carlo boys were in the local petrol station buying ice creams, and the loud lads were eating their protein chips. <laughs> 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 and right, right there, you have the difference now between winning in the championship and losing in the championship. But there were amazing results, amazing results. I mean, I wouldn't have, well, I'd have got the loud one right, but I wouldn't have got the other. I wouldn't have got the other ones. I'd have lost out there. Um, and loud actually, I saw afterwards, Mickey Hart was not impressed. With the five goal win that they coughed up a lot of other stuff. So could they be dangerous next week? They probably Kildare. will be. It's Kildare for them, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Wicklow have Mead. Yeah. And Wexford, of course, have the dubs. So like you'd say this is the end of the of the trail, wouldn't you? 
Um, look, they gave him a good rattle last year, but I, I think the Dubs, <laughs> they may be going through a bit of turmoil, but I think they'll be forewarned now on what to expect from a Shane Roach Wexer team. They might actually expect to be tackled and shouldered this time, so they might be prepared for it, because you got the impression last year, they're like, what? What are you doing? What are you? <laughs> Stop touching us. Um, the, ta- the Talchin Cup could be a bit of crack if, if, uh, if all the teams buy into it. No, Carew, know, yeah, 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 like Carew, Michael, yeah. Carew's, um, that was ominous, I thought. They asked him, um, well, will the lads sign up for um, for the Talchin Cup? No. And he said, hard to know. He said, I suppose I'll know, a lot. I'll know more on Friday. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. No, that didn't sound... Sorry, Mr. Once. I'll know no, more after I head up to the US Embassy and see how big the queue is. Yeah. <laughs> like that's, that's it. I mean, Carlo, I have been going through a rough patch. Yeah. Certainly for this season. Um, Which has been made worse by the fact that they had a couple of years where they yeah. really flew close to the Carlo, sun. Carlo rising and all that. Like, yeah. I mean, they, they, had a, they had a couple of terrific seasons. It's just kind of come away from them. Like, I mean, but sorry, Rory is dead right. I mean, if, 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 if um, you know, the bulk of the teams take the Tyson Cup seriously, that's going to be an absolute cauldron. Like I mean, yeah. there's a Great. there's not an awful lot between we say the nominal top team in the Tajikistan Cup down to about number 10, 12, 11. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But like the thing about Leash is is hmm, I don't know. Like at the end of the warm up competitions, the Oberon Cup, they got the Oberon Cup final, and I, I kind of I saw little bits and pieces of them and was chatting to a couple of pieces of a couple of people in the area. I thought there might be something in Leash this mm-hmm. spring, but then Division Three got away from them pretty badly, and I mean. As Kevin says, they are the team that you think that's number four or number three or whatever. But again, at a time when Dublin are sort of, you know, coming back from where they were, you'd be hoping that Leash, Kildare, Mead would be coming up towards them rather than going back the other way. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately for Leash at the moment, this is, you know, they've had a couple of bad seasons now. And you would, again, you would hope that they're a team that would just hold steady and give the Talchin a rattle because they're certainly a team that they, they need something. They need a couple of wins in the summer just to keep the, keep the thing going. Yeah. Well, isn't there, there's about um, six or seven of the Talchin Cup teams are now identified already, isn't that, after two mm. weeks? Well, and I've heard nothing whatsoever from the GA about the launch of the, the draw, the Talchin Cup. Are, are, are you booked for anything, Rory? This, semi, doing a, semifinals, this? And fi- semifinals and finals. No, no, but in terms of the launch, of, like try to send oh, no. the competition. Sure, sure, sure. None of the... Sure, no, look... I don't know whether you can park blame or uh, 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 um, maybe put some mitigating circumstances at the GA's door in terms of profile promotion and launches in general. But it's very, very difficult to do any of this when the, oh, players, are, the, when the players are refusing to speak. Yeah. I mean, we've had farcical couldn't, situations. Couldn't you, couldn't we've you had farcical set, situations. You settled the, the bloody week. thing. <laughs> Farcical situations for the last two weeks around man of the match, for instance, you know, yeah. oh, I'll, I'll accept the award, but I won't speak. I'll accept the award, but I will speak. I'll accept the award, but I'll only stand in the photograph. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, yeah, well, that, that one, I think, is being worked out in smoky back corridors as we speak. They um, need to get moving. Yeah, they will. Mm-hmm. Um, a, a word for, for Ben Brosnan, I think, Kevin, who can make us just... People yeah. of my vintage, you can just make us feel better about ourselves. You know, 2008, 2009, heyday of Wexford football. He was there with his long, flowing locks. Now he's got a slightly more sensible haircut. He's a father, you know. You know, the the, the best days are behind father. him. What age is he, Mikey? 34. He was always a good footballer, Mikey. Like, oh, he's in, oh, in, in fabulous. Okay, so not- was a big part of that. He's got rid of the white boots as well, I think. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I would need that. But, um, one five yesterday. I have him down for um, one eight. One eight. Mm. Was it one five from play? Maybe I was wrong. Um, I, I think one five. Be. I noted. No, he got yeah, one eight four from four from free. So one four from play. But that's a great haul now. Yeah. And, and his goal, even though I know it was the midfielder that made it for him, I was trying mm. to get an eight on the midfielder. He made a great, great jump in the crowd. But not only that, he, he, he his hands, he had lovely hands, and he had the he had the good sense as a midfielder to give it to the corner forward on the last play. But but uh, Ben then or oh, just he rifled it into the into the top into the top corner. It was a smash and finish. And uh, but all the scores were were very good scores. If you if you can kind of play them back, the bit I saw on the TV last night. Um, but Brosnan has been a good player for lo- a long long time. Like if 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 we still had the Railway Cup, wouldn't he be one of those forwards yeah. that would make would make a Railway Cup team? Yeah, yeah. And uh, but fair play to him. Uh, and I I, I saw uh, or I read it or I hear it that he's had really a horrible time with injuries as well of late. 
and yet here he is at 34 and really looking forward to Dublin next week. Fair play to him. Just like it's hard yeah. to be looking forward to Dublin coming down to have a cut at you. Um, it was um, it was Liam Coleman, by the way. He was a midfielder, Kevin. Oh, thanks. I dug Liam it out Col- for you. Well, he was. Um, that was an outstanding piece of work by Coleman. Like he made the goal, but by God, Brosnan applied uh, applied the finish. So it was a great win for them. Um, and as, as I said to you earlier, I'm I'm scooting down to Exford Park next Saturday. I'm really looking forward to seeing well one where Dublin are. And just seeing what is it now Wexford can put up against them. I hope it's not. I thought last year, now I have to be truthful, Mikey. I, I thought last year was a little bit um, chains and handcuffs now. You know, it was, I thought it was very, very defensive. I it wasn't much of a spectacle now. Maybe the truth. But, uh, but I know it needs most and all yeah. that. I, like they have a younger team now this year, Wexford, I, I, I understand. So hopefully they'll have a little bit more of a cut. But I, I, of course I understand that you can't open up against Dublin and you get murdered as well. But, but uh, yeah, looking forward to that. Well, Wexford are one of those counties as well. That there's just this wonderful tradition of football kind of buried, buried in the ground. You know, it's there. It's there the whole time. And you have, I, I'd often look at Wexford when they, when they do have a win like this or, you know, they have a little, there's a little bit of momentum behind them. You go, Jesus, if they could only just harness it and kind of just nurture the football and I know that they pride themselves on being a dual county and, and giving equal and whatever equal status to both but there's clearly more work to be done in terms of developing football there but they always have nice players and as I said they have that sort of they have that tradition in in in, in the bones of themselves you know yeah. um, and the capacity to be more than they are um, probably you know, when you look at back over the decades you know but you know Hopefully it'll give a good old rattle next uh, time. You know? It was an eight-point win for uh, the Dubs last year in the end, 15 points to seven. Ben Brosnan wasn't playing, so there's your eight points difference made up straight <laughs> away next Saturday night. <laughs> throw, throw in the old goal for the win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, Andy, three-point win, and on we go. Um, no, look, it, it, it might be, it, look, it might just be like, it's that's it, that's, that's the golden moment of the summer. But as you say, there's a chance for Wexford and a lot of counties there to kind of harness, you know, these nice early championship wins and kind of turn them into something in the Talchon Cup because it's needed. And um, I right, personally, after that, I was so pleasantly surprised by that result, having given Wexford no chance that like I, I would value a, a win over Tipperary or New York or anybody else in the Talchon Cup just as much because it's extending a summer that we don't think is going to be extended by the hurlers, which kind of goes back to Kevin's point. It's like the hur- the hurler, the footballers can only flourish when the hurlers kind of are in the doldrums it's almost it always seems to be kind of that um, but usually they're both terrific. in the doldrums wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be terrific now for you to see and and, and you're really call, or, you know to see Wexford playing in Cole Park in the Talchon Cup final you know and, and I, you know what I'm going to say next it, all the pity is that it wouldn't be the curtain raiser for the All-Ireland but it would still in some time in, in, in July I think it's is it programmed yeah. Rory is it yeah really? semi-finals semi-final football the ninth, semi-final the 9th the yeah. of July yeah. yeah, so I mean, that would still be a big day out, wouldn't it? I mean, it, to it see... would be nice to get back to Crow Park after watching all the, the the many comical and different ways we found to lose those Leinster finals to Dublin over the years. It'd be nice it to also, get back it, there it, again. It, 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 and it is really important if you want to develop a team. I mean, this is the whole reason why, you know, the strong get stronger is because mm-hmm. they're together for longer, they're training for longer, they're in that group mentality for longer. So the Touching Cup affords teams to main, continue that group ethic for an extra couple of weeks or months and i think if you're an aspiring uh, side you need to take that chance yeah it's a critical for it's a critical fortnight for the talchin cup now the next the next fortnight mm-hmm. in terms of who's going to talk who's going to support it who's going to stay around the draw um, now needs to be made a big thing of yeah. as well i would yeah. suggest and, and soon true yeah once they have a few more they, i guess they want to know the bulk of the teams but they will know them in the next fortnight um oh yeah one one team who uh, won't be in touch couple will be in the qualifiers are our Ma and and Mick. I was just talking to uh, Niall McCoy, who uh, obviously works for ourselves and has been on the podcast a few times, works for Gaelic Life, a proud Arma fan. And um, he, I, he's struggling to come up with the words, you know, the disgust he feels, the disappointment he feels. If I was an Arma fan, I don't, I don't know what I'd be thinking this morning. Probably thinking pretty much something similar to what you would have thought in other seasons gone by. <laughs> like, it's nothing new. Like yeah. it's 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 only new in the sense that there was a you know a glimmer. A, I, I clearly back in Division One playing well and you know and clearly a lot of very good players uh, on 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 the pitch um, and you know again this Donegal Armagh kind of game kind of felt like a 
pecking order one. You know, you beat Donegal, you move up, you move a lot closer to Tyrone all of a sudden. Um, but look, it's not the first time that Armagh have come to a game like this and fallen apart, you know, and it's something that they're going to yet again have to reflect on. And where did this, what the hell, Lord Jesus, why? Because I mean, you can imagine, like you can imagine how many times that has been mentioned in conversations and meetings, lads, this is the one, you know, we're not, we've been here before, but this is the day we're all going to stand up and say no more, you know, this is the day we're going to take the step forward. I, the bits like I mean I was I was more focused on 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 Tip Clare and and Gollum Mayo yes let's be honest but I mean the highlights that I've seen of it they just looked ragged and Donegal to be fair to Donegal you know good solid championship team um and again and, and another team actually that probably have kind of stumbled a little bit when they've got to that step to go to another level but you know they had to yesterday was almost about holding their ground you know to keep our man down and they did. And they did it very well. Michael Murphy looked terrific. Jason McGee had a good game. Uh, McBrearty again there for the goal. Um, looked, looked looked very impressive. Yeah, Kev. Every one of their forwards, bar Jamie Brennan, scored from from play. This is just another example of chalk it down to like they are the Jekyll and Hyde team of like the All Ireland contenders or the teams you know below the All Ireland contenders. Because some days they do look like all our t- contenders, and the next day you think they they'd struggle in the Talchin Cup. So like it's they're 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 maddening, I would imagine. Did, are, are you talking Donegal now? Or, yeah, uh, Donegal. Yeah. Um, I I'd, I'd say and I I follow Donegal now uh, in the flesh a lot in the last two or three years. Rory has, has sent me to a lot of those matches, or, or whereas I, I've ended up at a lot of them, um, and. A bit like Mick was saying about our man, you're expecting Donegal. Mm. You, you remember the draw with Perry in the Super Super yeah. Eights from mm. you, and you, you think, Ooh, they're they're on the move. And then Mayo clipped them down in Castle Bar and knocked them back a bit. But you still said, no, there's too many good players, and they have a lot of good players, mm. good footballers, big men, rangy. Use that word again. Um, so the 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 big thing for Donegal yesterday. This is my my sense of it. If I'm if I'm in the the, the Donegal backroom team. This is your passport to the Ulster final. Because they're going, they're Donegal are going to be Cavan. You can take that as like they have unfinished business there. Cavan whipped them in a pandemic final and they will not forget that. So there's no sense of any overconfidence in a semi-final. But the flip of that coin is that passport to the final was pretty much there for Armagh as well. Mm-hmm. And that was the statement win that Armagh needed. They haven't got it now, and all the angst now that's going to going, going to develop in, in, in the week ahead. But for Donegal, um, they played very well. I, I'd suggest that's the best we've seen from them in a couple of seasons. Because um, it was it was consistent. It was steady. It was doing the right things. Of course, Murphy at the centre of it. But Langan, well up there too. McBearty doing his stuff. Um, uh, defensively, pretty mean as well. Um, I didn't Reno, Reno Neal didn't score so he didn't, from, he didn't no, score no. from play anyway Brendan McCall did a great job on him yeah and, and McCall is that type of uh, 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 limpid he just you know he welds him have on to you and it's it's it's, uh, it, it's not simple so they have an awful lot going for them Mikey I, I think now that they have taken out Armagh I think they have a passport to the final um, and we do we, I couldn't bet yet who they'd meet in that final because Monaghan Tyrone are, are, are all over there um, thinking about life, so um, there's a lot to be there's a lot to be contested for there yet, and Derry are in the mix as well. So it's a brilliant win for Donegal. It's it's a bit like Galway. That's I I'd see it very similar to Galway's win yesterday. Kind of a statement win. They're out the gap. They're heading absolutely positively in the right direction, and there is a provincial final. What's the worst that can happen? You're in round two of the qualifiers, one step from Crow Park anyway. So the season is up and running. Yeah. Yeah, uh, touch on touch on Kevin and made a very good point last night about our ma in that you know maybe we all became slightly over enamored with their early season form on the basis that maybe they were a bit ahead of everybody else in terms of fitness and conditioning, and that when everybody caught up, like obviously Donegal eventually would, in terms of maybe timing their run slightly differently and you know just kind of you know working their way through the league. I think we kind of we saw we saw the results of it yesterday, and it's just very frustrating oh, from it's, it's just very frustrating from an Armagh perspective. In that, here we are, like I mean, it's, it's eight years into Geezer's reign, Geezer's tenure in charge, and geez, their their record in Ulster is 
You know, it's so poor. Like they've never have they had any statement in, in the Ulster Championship. No. Like they're the kind of team. It's a little bit like I don't know. I don't know who you can compare it to. Maybe Mayo and All Ireland final. It's very hard to tip Mayo and All Ireland final and they win one. So it's very hard to tip Armagh for me anyway. It's very hard to tip Armagh in any championship game of the likes of yesterday until they actually go win one, because mm. they're the only consistent record with Armagh over the last seven or eight years is falling down at this moment. Mm. You know they've taken some. I mean, was it Tyrone absolutely whacked them in in Croke Park one day uh, in a, in a All Ireland quarter final? I'm going to guess it was it was a later round qualifier. Um, mm. They had a game against Down one year that they should have around won. four no. maybe. Nick, yeah. yeah, it was something. That was later. I remember it was a yeah, and it was Crow Park, but uh, I think Down one year took them out. Um, they just there's something there, and you know Didn't a lot Armana. of Armana take them out only two years ago, and a lot of it comes back to it does come back to the sideline um, and whether they they can react in games, whether they can think their way through games. Um, stuff like that, whether that's correct or not, you'd have to go back and really dig into the games themselves, but um, there's clearly something there. You think the disciplinary, uh, the week they had, the 10 days they had fighting the disciplinary side of it, you think that was uh, an aspect? I don't know. I think, Kev, like, once the ball is thrown in, does that stuff really bear too much relevance? I always remember... It can sap energy and focus. Yeah, emotional kind of energy. Yeah, like, possibly, like, maybe. I don't know. Uh, It's very... That's a very hard one to put a barometer on and gauge. I mean, I always think back to the famous... Look at the players involved, for instance, yesterday. Yeah, but... Like, none of them played well. mm, But I always think back to the famous Mill on the Hill, you know? Do you remember in 2007 when... Mayo warmed up in front of the hill and everybody thought it was a master stroke, a master stroke by Mayo because it really rattled Dublin. Sure, Dublin were temp- nearly eight, seven or eight pints up going down the home stretch. Who was thinking about the mill on the hill at that stage? I don't know, it's too much made of those types of things. Yeah, yeah, the, I, I, the, 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 no, I, I don't know, maybe like I mean, the point of it is that you're right, like there is mental energy expended. Right. I mean, quite quite apart from I mean, and also like just to, for the sake of comparing it to, to, to the mill on the hill, that was something that just happened of a shot. The, yeah. This is something that's been tipping along for weeks and sort of I look look, it's easy for Declan Bonner to come out afterwards and go, well, look, you know, we just wanted to concentrate on the guys we had and, you know, not be wasting energy on it, blah, blah, blah. That's fine when you win. I mean, Armagh had to do their best to get their best players out. I still think they shouldn't have taken the appeals. And when you see the nature of the reasons for the overturning of the appeals, technicalities, yeah. uh, look, there's a bit of, maybe there's a bit of justice here, but like, uh, it maybe it does, maybe it does just sap a bit. I mean, the, those disciplinary hearings, you're sure they were long affairs. There were a lot of work going into prepping to get them, you know, to the point of getting them cleared and the players don't not quite sure where they're going and they're getting asked constantly, you know, out and about. I mean, are you, you playing? Know, are you playing? Are you, are you playing? playing? Are you playing? What's the story? Any if news? You know, if you're real O'Neill, for instance, their top, top player, yeah. he spent three weeks, three and a half weeks, up until last Tuesday, I think, or Wednesday morning, Tuesday morning perhaps, uh, in his mind, not playing in this match. Yeah, that's yeah. a fact. Now that's 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 the baggage he brings into his prep. You know, I'm going to training, but I'm not playing in this match. Our fellas are saying, "Oh, we'll appeal and we'll do the best for you, and we'll lawyer up and all that." But like, that's the reality of it. That there's a there's a, there's a handful of players uh, there that think they're not partaking uh, until someone tells them otherwise. It's very hard to you have to be very strong mentally to to figure. It, but 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 even I think you've had to be around the block a bit as well. Rian, I don't know. I, I, that's not my head. I don't know how old Rian O'Neill is, but I like, yeah. you, like you know, if you've been around the block a few times, you know, and we can all think of players back mm. the years who would have been through this process once or twice. Different for them, but yeah. maybe but, for yeah. a kid like that going in and just. But but Kev, like do, this all came about because of that digging match that took place uh, against Donegal in the last round of the league. Right? Round seven, yeah. Now, so it, obviously the incident, which I think from what we're hearing, our Mafield was sort of, um, could, was was maybe constructed or there was maybe an element of, you know. Fire fa- planning. Yeah, right. But the thing for me is, if that incident and the aftermath and the legalities around it has manifested itself in such a way that it's derailed Armagh's entire season, which is effectively now what we're looking at. What does that say? Mm. 
Yeah, that's a, no, that's, a, that's a very fair point. I, I know personally that Armagh feel very aggrieved about the way. Yeah, but you need to get over these things, you know. Yeah. Like you know, the, not, the, like. Yeah, but you know, but this, when, when there is a sense of hurt, Rory, in a camp, like they're looking at. I think you had pictures yesterday of half time in the Connacht final last year in Crow Park. Mayo and Galway boxing themselves going down the tunnel. Yeah, yeah. And 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 you know Dublin and Mayo previously and nothing Perry, happened for those. Kerry yeah. and Mayo down in Chile or and nothing happens. And then all of a sudden the rules are being uh, and I want to be fair to both sides. Uh, um, the rules are being um, scrutinized uh, and Armagh come out as the big losers in it. There is a sense of um, victimization in it and I, I think that probably did feed in a bit to it because no matter who you are and Mick you make a good point he, 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 yeah he's, he's really you know, he is a superstar and I said that use that word a good bit about him but he is young and if, he, if he's Jeremy Condy or maybe that type of player he's been through the process I'm sure it's water of a duck's back there he knows look you just get on with it until someone absolutely tells you you can't play and I yeah. said are, are you assume I will be playing until someone tells you you can't play, Gosh. that might be the way to flip it. In fact, <laughs> yeah. with the current with the current system, that is the way. To <laughs> <laughs> you might as well take it that way. Um, a brief mention of Saturday's game up in Ulster. Um, another one where I was one of the few sage uh, pundits to predict this one right. Mickey Graham doesn't give a fiddlers about the league. I think we can all just accept that at this stage, can't we? He couldn't like if we're saying the league's the league, and I think he has Mick Foley levels of interest in the league. <laughs> interested in the league. they got promoted and won it you know, i know it. yeah yeah so, but, the, I mean, if that's but they lost the, the game here and there and people yeah. say oh they didn't set the, you know they weren't as dominant as we thought they might be they weren't the best you know rory said they weren't that pressed in the final they weren't you know no. th- then they put 13 points on antrim well i think like we said i think antrim played club league matches in, in april um which was kind of odd to say the least you know given the the whole but they're behind... players. uh i'm not sure yeah, because mo- we, we'd all be doing that, but you won't get you won't get a smell of your county there. No, if yeah. used to my understanding, there. my understanding, I'm I am entirely awaiting the statement from Antrim GA. My understanding, uh, a few weeks back, back in March when I when I heard this, was that the county players would have been able to play with their clubs. But as I say, I am completely open to uh, the Antrim County Board right. coming and clarifying that. Like the but, yeah, look, Kavanagh. Look, Anna, if if the game and you know take the Corrigan Park element out of it and the conversations around where the game's going to be played, if Cavan and Antrim had been played anywhere, you would have been, I think you would have been back in Cavan to win, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? Yeah, you would. Yeah, I, I I don't, you were giving yourself very big kudos there, Rory. For our, who, who said that was me? Was, that, I always you'll find I always give myself kudos when I predict yeah, any match uh, correctly. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, yeah that's that's one on one stuff. Yeah, I would. <laughs> but you it it wasn't here last week. There's several people back in Antrim here now. Last week, I won't. Yeah, you'll have to watch back. Don't name and shame. I don't see Kevin having. Um, I really can't see Kevin. Um, getting any shot against Donegal. Oh no, no, no. Did we say that a couple of years ago? Uh, well, I did, and of course, uh, I, I did that match, and I couldn't. I remember going across the pitch. This is absolutely true, lads. Before the game, we walked across the pitch, the middle of the pitch, myself and Ger it was Ger Canning, and uh, there was a few of the Cavan backroom team, you know, pocket, throwing the balls back into them, doing the warm ups. And I said, well, you know, can you how he fixed or I said, well, ho- hoping to give it, hoping to give it a good out shot and keep it, keep it right. <laughs> like they were, they were, it wasn't like they were saying you know, we'd be winning this one all right I, 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 it was as big a shock to them as it was to, yeah. to Donegal but fair play to them I mean they were they were brilliant champions and uh, the, the, yeah. I remember that night driving back through Cavan and by they didn't know how to celebrate winning an Ulster uh, the, they were, the, the town was the town was on fire but <laughs> and the uh, no I, I really don't if I know anything about anything I I see Donegal now really coming into their own in 2022 and having a real shot at this Ulster Championship. I was very disappointed with Antrim, though. I watched it here on BBC and I, and like, they're playing with a the wind. They fought for Corrigan Park. It won't be the first or the last time, by the way, a team fights for a home venue and gets their arses handed to them, but we'll come to that in a couple of weeks' time. But... Um, <laughs> The, they fought for <laughs> Corrigan Park, you know, they came out, they're playing with the wind and it's quite a strong wind and they didn't register a single score for the first 22 or 23 minutes. I was kind of saying to myself, Jenny, like even the first score they got, I kind of looked, I was looking at, I mean, from my angle, it even looked wide. They were just very, very disappointing. I think Cavan kind of took their best blows and put the game to bed pretty early. I think they were comfortable enough winners in the end. A very, very disappointing way for Antrim to 
mm. over the Ulster well, Championship, I think, I think, after a lot of promise shown during the league. Yeah, I think the, like, the, the odd conversation I'd have with people around the scene in Antrim, you know, it's, it's a bit of a, you know, it's an, like, like in a lot of counties, it's a bit of a battle sometimes to get things the way they need to be. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think their league form would have trailed off a little bit towards the end. So maybe, you know, maybe if they could put the champ- push the championship back into March, maybe. <laughs> might, have been, might have been better for them maybe possibly no but enough. then yeah. then Mick you miss out on like I couldn't get over this yes I, I do notice the important stuff the, league, the the championship's now starting in April and yet still inexplicably every pitch in Ulster is always sandy there's, there's always <laughs> sand kicking up off a pitch in Ulster even when it's not even summer yet and still you got the sandy pitches the in dust, Ulster the dust flying up it always I, anytime you ever see dust flying up I always think of Christy Ring and his prime <laughs> How did he get on in the Ulster Football Championship? Oh, he would have loved it. He would have loved, loved it. it. <laughs> yeah, loved it. Absolute bull. All right. On there's that, a, there's an image. <laughs> yeah. And that's rather strange image. We might leave it. Um, yeah. Thank you to Mick. Thank you to Kevin and Rory, always, as always, and to uh, Shane Dowling earlier. And um, we'll be back on Thursday to preview the weekend's action. So we'll catch you then. Good luck. by winning the last two matches on the road and that's not going to be taken away from us. What I love in Hurling, I love players that will never give in. He hits it, he hits it, it's over the bar!